Welcome to the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh and I'd like to turn it over to our speaker for the talk today. Well, thank you all for having me back. I've talked a bit about extragenital gonorrhea and chlamydia in the past and today I'm going to focus on self-collected specimens from a project we did here at Madison Clinic. And I do have to disclose I've received research support from Whole Logic. I wanted to briefly make sure we're on the same page on the knowledge about the epidemiology of these infections. Pharyngeal and rectal gonorrhea and chlamydia are very, very common among men who have sex with men. Among men who come into an STD clinic to get tested, between 8 and 14 percent will be diagnosed with one of these infections. At the same time, these infections are primarily asymptomatic. So there are those who wonder, why are they important? And I'd argue there's three reasons why these infections are important. The first being that they represent a reservoir of gonorrhea and chlamydia in the community. And we did a study from King County STD Clinic data that showed that 30% of symptomatic gonococcal urethritis could be attributed to oral pharyngeal exposure. Secondly, we know that these infections potentiate acquisition and transmission of HIV, and that's even after controlling for sexual behaviors. Lastly, and one of the most important reasons I think we need to test for these infections, is that there are differences in the treatment efficacy based on the site of infection. So we know that it is more difficult to treat pharyngeal gonorrhea than it is to treat anogenital gonorrhea. And that's one of the reasons we definitely emphasize using ceftriaxone over cefixime. Secondly, there have been a number of retrospective studies looking at the treatment differences between doxine and azithromycin for rectal chlamydia. And the preponderance of evidence there in this nice meta-analysis I cite there by Kong in 2015 shows that doxy is superior to azithromycin for rectal chlamydia. So in, for both rectal chlamydia and pharyngeal gonorrhea, if you miss these infections and you only screen for urethral infections, you may not actually cure them if you use suboptimal treatment. So current CDC recommendations for STD screening in MSM, as you all are aware, is a triple dip screening at all sites of exposure for gonorrhea and chlamydia, as well as syphilis and HIV for HIV negative patients. It is recommended that you screen, screen annually for all sexually active men who have sex with men and up to every three months for high-risk men who have sex with men. Unfortunately, screening nationwide is suboptimal. And there have been a number of studies that have looked at barriers to more frequent STD screening. And some of this data comes out of a survey that we did among patients and providers at the Madison Clinic. So there's kind of three areas of barriers to screening, patient-related barriers, provider-related barriers, and systems barriers. When asked, patients do want to be screened and they want it to be frequent, convenient, and affordable. Providers cite kind of a lack of knowledge on how to do extragenital screening, time is a problem during complex patient visits, and then unfortunately we found about 20% of our providers did not feel comfortable doing a sexual history or a genital exam. And lastly, systems barriers can be a major problem, and this is an area that if we have time after the talk, I'd love to hear from you what systems barriers you've had. But testing cost, I've heard of labs that are charging up to $275 per site. When you're asking for men to test at three anatomic sites up to four times a year, that can be very cost prohibitive. Combined with that are insurance issues. Some insurance are only covering once a year testing, which is problematic for those high-risk MSM. Lastly, nucleic acid amplification tests, which are the promoted way of testing these days, are not FDA approved for testing at pharyngeal or rectal sites. They are allowed to be tested if the lab has done an internal validation with CLIA approval, but not all labs have done that. In order to overcome some of these barriers to STD testing in our clinic at Madison, we created a self-testing program. This is a program that the patient can enter either by walking into clinic, that's the self-referred box there, or a provider can refer the patient at the end of the, the regular clinic visit. In the first scenario where the patient walks in and says, hi, I'd like my STD testing today, a nurse would screen the patient for any symptoms as we really only want to screen patients and anybody with symptoms should be treated and seen by a provider that day. In the second scenario where the provider refers the patient to self-testing at the end of a clinic visit, 
the provider should screen the patient for symptoms. In both of these scenarios, the patient is then handed a patient assessment form that helps the patient determine, based on their sexual activity, which sites of exposure to screen. So for example, this form asks, do you give oral sex? And if you answer yes, please swab your throat. Do you top or do you receive oral sex? If so, please provide a urine. Do you bottom, please swab your rectum. Once the patient has completed the patient's self-assessment form, they're directed into a restroom that we've converted into the self-testing room. On the wall in the self-testing room are these posters printed quite large, about three by five feet, each of them. And there is a chest of drawers that has all the supplies a patient would need in order to do self-testing. So these posters, if you've not seen them before, walk a patient through how to do self-testing, including opening the package, labeling the specimen, taking the specimen, and putting the specimen in the biohazard bag. Then th this room is located right near the nursing station, and then they hand the biohazard bag to someone from nursing staff who then directs them to the lab for syphilis testing. So we did an evaluation of this program to see if it changed our testing rates. And here we're looking at data from pre-intervention and the first year of the intervention. As you can see, we had about the same number of MSM who attended at least one primary care or nurse visit in this one year period. You can see at baseline, we had a fairly low testing coverage rate for our extra genital testing with about 25 to 30% of men being tested. While we did increase our testing significantly, we still are only at about 35 to 40%. One of the limitations from this evaluation, though, is that we don't have patient level data to know where their sites of exposure were and if this was a one, you know, one time testing for someone who needed multiple times testing per year because of their risk. We also look specifically just at the self testing program to see how well that for patient assessment form worked. And here we're looking at a subset, and of, among 348 men who said that they gave oral sex and should have done pharyngeal testing, 320 did, so 92%, which I would say is pretty good. Of those, for kind of curiosity's sake, 10% tested positive for gonorrhea at their throat. We look at the second line of data, 312 men said that they performed receptive anal intercourse, and 302, or 97%, actually did a rectal test. And of those, a lot more were tested positive. So we had 11% test positive for gonorrhea and 9% test positive for chlamydia. There's two other things I wanna point out on this slide, and that's that we had four tests rejected by the lab for labeling or collection errors. There was a lot of concern going into this program that patients couldn't do this themselves because they were going to mess up the collection yeah. kits yeah. or the labeling. And in our experience, that just hasn't been the case. With four out of 622 specimens that were problematic, I think that's fairly good, especially in the first year of the program. Over time, many men have gone through this multiple times and are very comfortable with the process. The other thing I want to point out is the data at the bottom. Only 269, or 77%, went to the lab and had syphilis testing done. And 100% of these men should have syphilis testing done, especially here in King County, where we had a 60% increase in the number of syphilis cases over the past year. And we're still trying to figure out why that has not happened yet. We also did an evaluation of patient acceptability of this program and different aspects of the program and received very fav favorable marks throughout. 92% thought that the overall program was very good, the assessment form was helpful, the throat and rectal posters were very helpful, and the supply location was very easy. So that is the conclusion of my talk. I want to acknowledge Sharisha Danaretti, who's sitting next to me here and who does a lot of the day-to-day -day maintenance on the, the self-testing program. Some of the other operational aspects of this are that when patients walk in for their self-testing all of the testing goes under Dr. Dana Reddy's name and she receives all of the results and has to deal with all the positive tests.